This time I'm talking about everything past Terry's major, and instead of it being the axillary artery, it has now become the brachial artery. Which makes sense, because that part of the arm is called the brachium. Brachium, brachial artery. And then everything that happens to it after that. So, let's get started. The brachial artery will immediately go ahead and make your deep brachial artery. It can be a little bit difficult to find at first in lab, as you guys may know, but it's a very, very important structure because it p provides all of the ancillary blood supply to all the blood downstream. Um, the big thing that you should also take away from it is the deep brachial artery will create an ascending branch. This is extremely important because it will anastomose with the posterior humeral circumflex artery. And the posterior humeral circumflex artery will also, of course, as you know, anastomose with the anterior humeral circumflex artery. So, say for example, if there is a f fracture in the head of the humerus and the anterior humeral circumflex artery is uh, ligated or somehow damaged, the ascending branch of the deep brachial artery has your back. So, just think about this anastomose and just, in general, any anastomoses moving forward. Anytime you hear somebody mention an anastomose, highlight that sucker, put as many stars as you can. That is very, very important to know. Moving forward, the deep brachial artery will also provide collateral circulation with the arteries downstream. So just to keep everybody in check, the cubital fossa, or the crease right here in your elbow, that's where we're at. So the cubital fossa, you'll have a ton of arteries going down. But let's start simple. The radius side, or the lateral side, or thumb side, is going to be up here. Your brachial artery will split to make the radial artery and the ulnar artery, or the medial side, or hypothenar area. So, in case of you guys lose direction, hypothenar, meaning pinky, thenar eminence, meaning thumb. Fancy word for thumb and pinky. Seems excessive, but I promise you'll get used to it with time. So as you continue down the cubital fossa, we have our radial artery, and just like I was saying before, you got to have a backup. You can't just have one artery. And so the radial artery on the back side of it, or posterior, behind the lateral epicondyle, will have the recurrent interosseous artery. This artery will anastomose or meet up with the middle collateral artery, which is another side, side chain of the deep brachial artery. On the front side, on the radial aspect of the arm, you have the recurrent radial artery, recurrent meaning it goes backwards, and that, and that will meet up with your radial collateral artery on the front side of that elbow. Um, I don't have a really good way of m remembering it, just, just straight up know it. <laughs> and then I also have some quite, uh, to follow that up with two other arteries, only this, si only this time it's coming off of the ulnar artery. You have your anterior ulnar recurrent artery. Makes sense. It's on the anterior side. It's coming from the ulnar artery, and it's recurrent, meaning it's going backwards. And that meets up with your inferior ulnar collateral artery. And then fi finally, of all the different like anastomoses, we have our posterior ulnar recurrent artery, meaning it's going on the back side of the medial epicondyle on the elbow to meet up with your superior ulnar collateral artery. Once again, all of these are here because, as you can imagine, the elbow is a sensitive place. It'll take a lot of damage, so it's always good to have a backup. So, continuing with our ulnar artery, it will give off what's called the common interosseous. I don't have it written down, but just know that anytime you have a common, that means it's going to give off at least two more branches after it. So, just like with common, we have our anterior interosseous artery and our posterior interosseous artery. It will go through the membrane that's between your radius and your ulna to give off your posterior interosseous artery. Just know that if it has interosseous, it's going to be feeding the deep structures. So for the anterior interosseous artery, you have that feeding your flexor digitorum profundus, your flexor pollicis longus, and your pronator quadratus. And that's once again coming from our anterior interosseous artery. And your posterior interosseous, just think pretty much everything on the back side of the forearm, if it's a muscle, it's probably going to be posterior interosseous artery. The exceptions would be the uh, extensor carpi ulnaris, 
that one because it's a carpi ulnaris will be the ulnar artery. It will not be the posterior interosseous. And then I would have to follow that up with the uh, extern extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi radialis longus, and brachial radialis. Those guys are the radial arteries. So clear as mud. Great. <laughs> Another thing to note is, now that we're moving here, is the radial artery, it basically just does a lot of the stuff on the posterior forearm. Um, know that uh, the radial artery will continue along, and then it will have a superficial and deep, deep branch. The deep branch will provide most of the deep palmar arch. This guy will be your friend, so it does most of the blood to all of your thumb and your index finger. All of the blood supply on the uh, ulnar digits, such as your pinky, ring finger, and middle finger, those ones will majority come from the ulnar artery. This stuff, I'm not sure how prevalent you're likely to see that, but just know that they exist and that the radial artery can most likely be found right on the posterior aspect of the hand, right at what's called the brevis sandwich. And hopefully I'll have another video explaining that here shortly. Once again, good luck with all this, you guys. I understand it's a lot of information, but as long as you draw this out and you have like a collateral question, you'll be ready.